Namaste, bitches. Navin out on No Limit Hold'em. Back with an exciting video series. I figured we were just going to tackle these six main ideas here in this quick video. Um, Zen and the Art of Stacking Bustas. Extreme Ownership Heads Up Edition. Heads Up Poker, The Liberation of U.S. Currency, A Love Story. Range Construction, Lion Creek. Okay, actually, what this is is I'm giving you guys, my viewers, um, the opportunity to decide what my next video and possibly video series is going to be. So if you want to vote on this, all you have to do is put your selection in the comment section. Just put Zen and the Art of Stacking Busts. And usually I only get about 10, 12 comments, so there's a pretty good chance that if you vote on something, that it uh, becomes the thing. So <clears throat> these are the options. Look them over for one more moment. Maybe just pause it. Go ahead and throw your comment in before anybody else gets a chance to and just, just W this thing. Okay. So in today's video, though, we're going to be talking about just my overall tank, uh, tank, my overall take on No Limit Hold'em heads up for small and micro stakes games. Um, I've been getting a lot of requests for this kind of a video, something that's just going to look at like, you know, uh, as much information as possible that's not like too complicated in a, I mean, you know, like accessible spot. Um, so I'm just going to say that this is the best I can do in like a very short period of time <clears throat> while still kind of being somewhat, uh, well, you know, without overgeneralizing too much. Like this is the most information and the most compact format that I can give you where it's going to be useful and discernible and not like 18 hours, right? So um, there's two ways to look at poker and we need to take those two ways to look at poker and think about poker and we need to figure out what to do with them like what what is the answer you know if there's like these two separate paradoxes and there's people that are like no we just need to exploit the shit out of people and there's people that are like no we just learned uh, game theory optimal and we just play that way and we can't be beat um, what's the reality uh, should we strive to be balanced and unexploitable at all times? Should we look to take advantage of every single weakness in our opponent's game? Um, or is there maybe a different paradigm? One that doesn't necessarily say, no, we've got to exploit everybody all the time, or no, we've just got to be a GTO robot. Um, well, this is the way I recommend playing poker, particularly heads up. Um, and especially on Ignition, where uh, it's anonymous. There's no uh, heads-up displays. Nobody's got um, uh, very much information or stats on you. Um, and uh, the way that I would recommend and the way that I try to go about uh, studying poker, teaching poker, thinking poker, playing poker, is we want to look at poker strategy through the lens of game theory. Um, like we have to know some things about game theory in order to have a general sense of how uh, we even would go about exploiting our opponent. Now, once we kind of have that understanding of like the basic uh, indifference principle and what balance means and what kind of leaks can be exploited and how to exploit them, um, then we need to know um, like how how to go about it like what's the like the metagame of it uh, should we just find everything that our opponent does wrong and beat on it until they change uh, should we just play a game theory optimal based strategy and hope that the money comes to us well regardless of what your take on that is I, I would say there is no better way to learn poker than to understand poker from a game theory perspective. Um, I mean, you really can play a balanced strategy and make money. Um, there's, you don't have to know anything about your opponent. If you're playing closer to GTO than they are, you're going to win. 
Um, you could just like play a very balanced GTO based game and allow the money to come to you. Um, and I think that's the first thing you should think about when you start playing against this, a specific opponent um, or when you're learning, when you're studying the game, when you're training, when you're uh, doing coaching sessions, when you're talking poker with your friends. Uh, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to just say, I think we should do this. No, I think we should do that. Well, I mean, what do you mean by we should? Um, and, you know, I think that the default thing that it should mean, um, see, because people mean different things when they say we should do this, or we should take that line, or we should take this line. No, I don't like that. I, I like this. And there's, like, really three main things they could mean. They could mean the game theory optimal strategy probably looks more like this. That's the first thing they could mean. The second thing somebody could mean is in this player pool, you know, against these types of opponents or in general, at this stake, we should do this. Um, and the third thing is against this villain, this specific opponent, we should do this. And if you're not very clear when you're talking to a poker buddy, a coach, a student, about which one of those three levels or, or which one of those three perspectives you're taking, I mean, you could both agree on everything fundamentally, but really have a big argument or debate about something, right? So um, I think what you should do is say, before you talk about a hand, before you talk about like getting a line check or designing a range, you have to say specifically GTO, or like balanced, right? Or given a metagame, like at small stakes, uh, NL6, no, no one hold them, what should we do? Or at, you know, NL10, uh, full ring, on ignition poker, between the hours of 6 and, you know, 10 or whatever, uh, what should we do here? Or against a player uh, who is very loose and aggressive and makes a lot of uh, bluffing mistakes and uh, uh, doesn't like to fold, um, you know, or I guess you could even say against this guy, Brandon, that we all know, right? But you have to specify. If you don't specify, you're not really saying a lot. Um, so, yeah, you can play a GTO-based strategy, and you can do fine with that. Um, or you can really just take it to your villain by attacking everything you find to attack. Um, you could enter the game with ideas about the metagame. You could try to play balanced until you see leaks, and uh, then when you spot that leak right here, right now, try to go after it. Um, you could go after it a little bit. You could exploit it to the maximum. Um, you should just, you could go like completely binary and say, well, villain under bluffs river, I'm not calling with any of my bluff catchers, or uh, villain overfolds turn, I'm double barreling 100% of my bluffs. Um, but then you can ask the question, like, should you tap the glass? Like, should you be so imbalanced that your opponent might catch on to it? Um, and these aren't really easy questions to answer. Uh, but what I think we're really talking about is, how do we beat our opponents at Nolan and Holden? And the only way to do that is to make less mistakes than they make. So good players are the players that what? They're the players that make the fewest mistakes while inducing the most mistakes. How do we do that? Sharp default lines with good, well-constructed ranges, understanding what imbalances look like and how to exploit them, and knowing how to make good adjustments and counter adjustments. That's it. I mean, that really is it. That's the game. On a more meta, um, or from a more meta perspective, I like to find, whenever I find a leak that I'm sure about, I like to pound on it. Just completely make binary adjustments and go, go, go. Um, you never know when your opponent's going to quit you. You never know if he's ever going to adjust. Um, you don't know if he's good enough to realize that you're exploiting him. And there's a chance that if he did, he wouldn't be playing such an exploitable style. Um, and also, this might be the most important thing. When your opponent sees you exploiting him, when he makes an adjustment to that, he will often over-adjust. So when he tries to react to you, when you're kind of playing a reactive strategy where you're reacting to your opponent's strategy, when he reacts to that, he's going to open himself up a lot further most of the time 
than how far you've opened yourself up. And he's not going to be used to playing this game. So I absolutely think that we should pound on our opponent's mistakes, beat them up, attack, 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 make these like big, huge binary adjustments, all or nothing adjustments, until, or really unless, our opponent adjusts. And when they adjust, when they react to us, then we counter that. And then if they counter the counter, then we're playing poker. But the other big kind of metagame edge that you'll get this way is when you start getting into this kind of a poker game, with most of your opponents, they're not going to be used to that. You know, they're, and if you get very used to it, then they're not used to it. You can kind of drag them into deep water. And you'll find people doing the most ludicrous, ridiculous things when you get like three or four iterations into counter-adjust, counter-adjust, counter-adjust. Um, I mean, it really can become very absurd. And people just, you know, if, uh, if you're forcing them to play a style that's not their normal style, then you're basically taking time off of their overall experience level. Like if they've been playing for 10 years, but they've been playing this basically this main style for the last three years, if you can drag them out of that style, you might take a player who's been roughly playing 10 years, but really playing the strategy for three years, so he's got like three years worth of good solid experience, and you might turn him into a player that's like got six months of good experience, you know? Um, just because he's not used to the situations he's getting himself into, or you're helping him get into. So what I would advocate for small stakes, and I would say $50 heads up is kind of close, um, but definitely anything under that. Uh, when we start, and these are for heads up, set, and go specifically, like on ignition poker, uh, very specifically, go to two to three times the big blind at 75 big blinds uh, with 65 to 85% open ranges. Um, and the way that we should do that is if we're opening for like a min raise, we should be closer to the 80 plus ballpark. Um, and if we're more like three times the big blind, we should be more like the 65, 70% ballpark. Uh, but I think really in today's game, um, the very best thing we can do is just go like 2.5x with a 70 some, like 70 to 75% open range. I think that's fantastic. That's what, that's what I do nowadays most of the time. Um, I think our three bet percentage should be right around 10 to 15 percent. I think it should be polarized as a pure default, um, but not exactly polarized and balanced where we're just like uh, three betting um, a GTO type range, but without the uh, board coverage. I think that uh, the way that I would have you construct a light three bet range, or I'm sorry, a three bet range is start off with what you would consider to be a good continuance range. And then take the poles, the very best hands and the very worst hands in that range. Start there. Uh, like use, you know, maybe 50-50. That's going to be a fine starting point. So if you want to go like, uh, if you find your uh, call versus open raise range, uh, let's just say it's 60% of all hands, uh, then if you're going to come up with this, uh, say, 12% three bet, then take the best 6% of hands and the, if, what, did, what did I say, 60% continuance. So take the best 6%, like the top 6% of all hands, and then also take like the uh, 54th to 60th percentile, or 55th to 60th percentile, something like that. Um, and if you want to go to like 15, then go, you know, 7.5 and 7.5% on the polls. Start there. But because we're playing smaller stakes, I think we want to then, that's our starting point, but then we want to take the worst hands that we are three betting as a bluff and drop them entirely, fold them. Then we want to take the best hands that we're three betting as a bluff in that range and turn them into flat calls. Uh, so let's say you had 6% in your bluffs. Take, you know, maybe two, let's say you have 7%. Then maybe take 2% out. Um, of the bluff range, uh, partially by putting it in, like taking the best hands that you might be tempted to three bet bluff, like ace five offsuit, put it in your flat calling range. Then take the um, the worst one percent, uh, like the I don't know five three suited, and just fold it, you know, against these opponents, against small stakes or micro stakes players. Uh, but we still want to get back to that you know, 12%, 15%, 3-bet uh, percentage. So how do we do that? 
Well, we add hands to the value pole. So we're not going to be exactly merged. We're not going to be exactly depolarized. Uh, our poles, the poles of our three betting range will not meet in the middle. And we're not going to three bet our entire continuance range. We're not going to three bet just the best hands in our continuance range. But we're going to expand our value range because, well, like in a purely balanced three bet range, polarized, maybe the worst hand you three bet is ace 10 suited, something like for value, right? Um, but maybe you want to include ace 10 off suit and ace 9 suit. You know, maybe the worst hand you normally three bet is like uh, king jack uh, suited. So maybe you want to include king jack off suit, king 10 suited, maybe even king 10 off suit. Um, and then just remember when you face a four bet, you can't just do the normal thing where you continue with your entire value range. You'll have to actually take some of the hands that you added to the value end of your three bet range and turn those into three bet folds. Um, so usually if you're polarizing, you won't have like uh, value bets that three bet and fold to a raise, um, but in this case you will. Uh, and the way the reason we're doing this is because we're exploiting the fact that our opponents are bad at folding and they call too often and they don't four bet as a bluff. And the best way to exploit that is to bluff less often, um, to widen your value range, to include hands that are thinner value bets, and then to fold those versus four bets. Um, I think you should see about a polarized range. Um, and I think we should get to the next slide. Um, so to exploit specific imbalance, we first have to understand incentives and how they line up. Uh, and the concept of goes with. Uh, the yin and yang. Like in poker theory and strategy, there's really no time domain. So you can't say that, like you can say most of the time, if I'm opening a wider range, I'm using a smaller raise size. But it's not that I should use a small raise size, and a raise size that's that small causes me to use a wider open range. Um, and it's not that I want to open this wide range, so I have to use the small sizing. It's just that small sizings go with wide ranges. And there's a lot to that, and we can get into that, um, and we will get into that in the series. Um, but understanding incentives, uh, how they work out, and like, just as an example, if I know that my opponent uh, is very uh, fit or fold on the flop, so if he doesn't hit anything like a good draw or a pair, he's just going to chuck fold. But once he does check and call, he's very sticky on the turn. Like So he's not going to call with nothing. He's not going to float. He's not going to put moves on. Um, but once he has a hand, he's not going to let go of it on the turn. Um, but if I also know that he's pretty, since he's getting to the river with a wider range, um, that he will fold a lot to river bets, uh, triple barrels. Well, the fact that he's calling um, all of the hands, that, or most of the hands that he calls the flop, he's calling on the turn, then I have no incentive to double barrel as a bluff. Does that make sense? Um, or I should say, if... Okay, so if he's going to just play fit or fold on the flop, uh, and he's going to be folding 50 plus percent against my half pot C bets, then I can C bet half pot on the flop as a bluff, and that's going to print money. But if he's continuing with the vast majority of the hands that he called with on the flop, if he's calling again on the turn with them most of the time, then I have no incentive to double barrel bluff. It's the fact that good players will call flop, and then with some of their hands, they'll call flop and fold turn that incentivizes me to sometimes bet flop, bet turn, and shut down. Um, now, if I know this player, this uh, guy that I, this, uh, this example player, if I know that he's exactly fit or fold on the flop, sticky on the turn, and nitty on the river, then I've got lots of incentive to make a one and done C bet, and I've got plenty of incentive to triple barrel. So it makes all the sense in the world against this guy to, to just fire one bet as a bluff on the flop and shut down. And it makes all the sense in the world to bet the flop, bet the turn, bet the river as a bluff. But it doesn't make sense to bet flop, bet turn as a bluff, and then give up on the river. We should never do that. We're not incentivized to do that. Another way incentives work is if my opponent bluffs a lot, then I have to bluff catch a lot. 
But if my opponent doesn't bluff enough by any amount, like if his uh, bet size is a pot size river jam, he's giving himself even money on his river jam, he's giving me two to one pot odds, uh, he ought to have two value hands for every one bluff. Then he's completely balanced and he puts my bluff catchers in, uh, well, he makes my bluff catchers indifferent or break even, which is really the idea. That's like uh, what you want to do with a polarized range. You want to construct your range and size your bets in such a way that even if you told me what your strategy was, there's nothing I can do about it. But as soon as our opponent uh, bluffs any less than he ought to, <clears throat> we should fold what percent of our bluff catcher? So let's say that in this situation, the guy should have 33% of his river jamming range should be bluffs. But we know that this guy is actually only bluffing 25% of the time. How often should we call with our bluff catchers? And by bluff catcher, I mean we're in a puller versus bluff catcher situation. Uh, this guy, we know that he's betting very nutted value hands on flop, turn, and river. And we know that he's like uh, triple barreling air or like his just dead bluffs, pure bluffs. But he's not using any of his mediocre strength hands to take a line like that. Uh, then any of our hands that are strong enough to beat all of his bluffs but are, are weak enough that they don't beat any of his value hands, those are our bluff catchers. So normally, if he's got the right balance of hands, if he's got two value hands for every one bluff and he's using a pot size bet, so he's giving us two to one pot odds, we should call with 50% of our bluff catchers. And that keeps him indifferent between bluffing and not. Uh, he's risking... Uh, say there's a $30 pot, he's risking $30 to win $30. We've got to make sure he doesn't succeed more than half of the time with his bluffs. So we have to do that by calling 50% of the time with our bluff catchers. Um, but we also, if we do any more than that, then we um, give him a clear way to exploit us. Okay, so in this situation where we ought to be calling with half of our bluff catchers and folding the other half, um, what should we do if this opponent, instead of bluffing the 33% that would be balanced and optimal, if he's only firing 25% bluffs on the river? So he's got three value hands for every one bluff. Now how many of our bluff catchers do we, do we call with in a vacuum or to maximally exploit him? What's the answer? I'll give you just a few seconds. It's zero. The answer is zero. Um... This is the kind of thing we're going to explore in more detail, but for now, I guess, maybe just kind of take my word for it. Or you could just think of it like this. If your opponent's not bluffing often enough, your bluff catchers lose money. Which ones? All of them. So these are the things we're going to talk about. Um, when we're creating a strategy, when we're designing lines, there's three fundamental mistakes, and we can kind of frame our hand as like value, bluff, and showdown value, or bluff catcher. Um, and then we can frame our opponent's mistakes out as um, tight, like nitty mistakes, um, compliant mistakes, and aggressive mistakes. If our opponent is overly tight, we just don't give them action and we bluff them a lot. We don't go for thin value because we're turning those thin value bets into bluffs. And we use very polarized, wide, bluff-heavy ranges. <clears throat> if our opponent calls too often, he's a, a calling station. He checks and calls. He's compliant. We can value bet thin. Uh, we don't have to bluff him, uh, and we can use a lot of bet fold lines. Um, this is uh, like we can, we don't have to be polarized. We can be more value heavy, and yet still be able to take a lot more bet fold lines, uh, even though we're using more value bets because we're using thinner bets than we normally would. We're actually going to be folding more often if this guy raises us. Uh, because we have all of our bluffs and our thinner value bets that we're just going to bat for value and fold to a raise. That's the way to beat that guy. What if our opponent's overly aggressive? We want to be less aggressive. We don't want to bat and raise as often. We want to be more compliant. Um, we want to check and call more often. Uh, we want to load up on the traps and load up on the hero calls. So basically you can say it like this. This is a rock, paper, scissors situation. If we've got a like this not these three styles form a nonlinear hierarchy where the tight aggressive player beats the calling station, the calling station beats the maniac, and the maniac beats the tight player. 
and that's another thing we're going to get into in more detail. Um, these are those three villains. This is what they do. Um, just a little bit more detail about them. Um, yeah, this is how you can identify them and how you should really think about these players. Now, the more specific we can get about our opponents, the more specifically we can exploit them. Uh, one of my students was talking about a guy he called Nemesis. He said the dude fights over every pot. He three bets a lot. He's peppering me with a lot of uh, C bets and double barrels, and he will even triple barrel. Um, he's floating my C bets. He's check raising me. He's trying to win every pot, right? So if we've got this guy who's floating C bets in position, check raising out of position, uh, with bluffs and for value, and um, he's calling down light because he doesn't want to fold. You know, this is the kind of guy um, that we'll see a lot, and there are very easy and simple ways that we can beat him. And I'll give you a hint. It's a little bit like playing face up. You want to kind of play face up against a guy like that. Um, but what if you're talking about a tag who will not play any pots with you? Just, he's got strong-ass ranges going to the flop, though, so it's like you're pissing off a bunch of money every time. It's like you feel like he's just folding pre-flop a lot, but then once, but that doesn't make you much money. But then once you go to the flop, you're like losing all these pots. How do we beat that guy? And this is so simple. Um, or this third villain. What if we have a guy that limps all of his buttons, and he's got a kind of a balanced limp range? Like he'll limp raise, limp call, and limp fold. But like, let's say he mostly limp calls, sometimes limp raises, but rarely limp folds. Um, he likes to give you the lead, and he's not afraid to trap and get sticky. I mean, these are players that don't really fit exactly into one of our normal archetypes. Um, and I've never done a video on how to beat very, very specific opponents. So that's one of the things I want to do in this series. Um, and this is just a reminder. If you haven't seen this, read this. Um, Navinad's line. We frame by relative hand value and we adjust by opponent's mistake propensity. Uh, we can think of this in terms of the ace-king-queen game. We always bet the ace. We sometimes bet the queen as a bluff. We never bet the king. So if we're playing three-card poker, there's three cards in the deck. Uh, you get one, I get one. Um, it's the ace, the king, or the queen. Then if you have the ace, you always bet it. If you have the queen, you bet it sometimes as a bluff. <clears throat> and if you bet the king, you never... Or if you have the king, you never bet it. This is the same as this, is the same as this. Um, relative hand value and opponent mistake propensity, right here. <clears throat> Good, sharp line construction is the ace-king-queen game. Is relative hand value and opponent mistake propensity. This is all, this is all the same. Um, and I want to show you in this series how these things kind of seamlessly flow from one concept to the next. Um, you know, that... Uh, we want to have a dynamic and efficient strategy. Uh, we want to judo them, you know? Like if they push, we pull. You know, what's the, what's the, the saying? Um, you, why, why do the pushing when the donkey will do the pulling, right? We use their mistakes against them. So then this line shows that. That we basically will have nut value, value, showdown value, a draw, or error. And the poles of this line, the red spots, that's where we have the most incentive to be aggress uh, aggressive. And then the middle is where we have the least or really no incentive to be aggressive. This would be like betting the king. This would be like betting the ace. And this would be like betting the queen. Now, it's not going to map on perfectly. It's a little bit more detailed than that. And there's non-zero and non-100% equities uh, that come into this. Um, the line represents a spectrum, right, where the ace, king, queen is like a, not binary, but trinary, right? Well, the tighter opponents shift us, shift our would-be, like whatever we would normally think of about a certain hand that we have. If our relative hand value would normally be value, a tight player shifts our relative hand value to the right, and we should play it more like showdown value. If a calling station is your opponent, um, a station who's got, like, he's going to take more check poly, not foldy, not fluffy kind of lines. Um, they shift your relative hand value to the left. So if you've got a draw, 
you should play it more like showdown value. In other words, you should check and call until you actually get there, because then you no longer have a draw, then you've got a value hand that shifts where? To the left, like nut value, we should go for stacks, right? Um, and this thing works. Maniacs, interestingly enough, <clears throat> they don't move you to the left or the right, they pull you towards the center. So if you have a draw against a maniac, tend to play it more passively. Uh, you don't want to bet and get raised off your hand. Um, and if you check and call, you've got really good implied odds against the guy who's going to barrel against your improvement cards, right? Um, <clears throat> if we have a value hand, what do we do? Against an aggressive player, it pulls us more towards center. If we have top pair with a reasonable kicker where we might bet, bet, bet against a calling station, we should check and call and check and call and check and call against a maniac. <clears throat> and this thing really does work. But it's just a different way of saying all of these things. And that's just another thing we'll get into. So that's all I have for right now. Um, uh, in conclusion, we need to have good default lines. So we're going to work on good default lines. We need to start with good starting hands, like have ranges that make sense. We need to know how to uh, create a good overall strategy um, so that that basic kind of GTO base strategy will always have it there as a point to retreat to. So, or, or even just a place to start a match where we can kind of launch attacks off from that like central safe place. Um, we have to learn what leaks and imbalances look like and we have to learn how to punish people for specific leaks. <clears throat> um, and we have to be aware of our own image. And learning, learning those two things kind of uh, happens at the same time. Like if you learn how your imbalances look to your opponent, then at the same time you're learning what your opponent's imbalances will look like to you and vice versa. Um, and we need to really, for some reason, people need to be taught this. And I, I think it's like, people that are actually decent at poker don't get this. They don't do this. Um, and that is, to be ever on the lookout for imbalances, things to exploit. Like, that's the first thing that you should be thinking about. You start a heads up, sit and go. The, the code that there is to crack, like the game above or before the game, is very simply, how am I going to beat this guy? And especially with, uh, like, ignition poker, um, you don't know anything about your opponent when that game starts. So you should be very vigilant when it comes for trying to figure out what your opponent is doing wrong. That's your, it's kind of your job at the poker table. Like, you should be learning all of this stuff off the table. You shouldn't be trying to figure out how to exploit a specific leak while you're playing the game. When you're playing the game, the only thing you really need to be doing is trying to figure out what your opponent's imbalances are and trying to keep track of what your image is uh, and then like play the opposite of it in a way. Um, like if we're running really super hot and we're raising and 3-betting every hand and c-betting every flop but not getting anything to show down, well, we're going to have a pretty aggressive image and we have to think about how our opponent might react and respond to that. We have to be hyper aware on the lookout for those types of adjustments. And then once we see him make those adjustments, then we do the uh, kind of level thing where, remember, this is a rock, paper, scissors type thing. So if our opponent thinks that we're playing rock, 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 then as soon as he figures that out, he's going to go to paper. So we're not going to go from rock to paper to scissors. We're going to go from rock to scissors. Like once, so we're playing this style that doesn't necessarily, it doesn't really matter what it actually is. What matters is what it looks like to your opponent. And if we're playing a style that's balanced, but it just so happens we're running hot, then if we like are playing a style that appears to be very, very aggressive, rock, 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 at some point our opponent is going to start stationing us off. As soon as we see him start to go to paper, we go straight to scissors. So as soon as we see him starting to make more kind of sketchier call downs, 
we go straight from rock, which we could say is the very agromaniacal style, directly to paper, or I'm sorry, scissors, where we just take all of the bluffs out and value bet them to pieces. That's how you win at poker. And that's how you get good enough to keep winning um, and to beat different kinds of players. It's all right here. I mean, you could really figure it out from this just intro video, uh, but you won't have to. Um, so I'm going to give you some more information about that, maybe in the comments or maybe in the next video. Um, I've got some things to mm, iron out, figure out exactly, like the price. Um, but yeah, so I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, any questions, leave them in the comments and cast your vote for what the next free video is going to be. Till next time, guys, Navinad on, no limit, hold them over and out.